Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sorting Hat Podcast, the show where everything and anything can and will be sorted. I, as always, am your host, Michael Barrett, joined by my co-host, Reed Bryce. To be or not to be. Oh, man. That is a question. Mm. <laughs> Was that not it? It was exactly it. Bravo, oh. bravo. Round of applause. Oh, oh. stop throwing roses. Stop. <laughs> all right, all right. So <laughs> the, the basic conceit of the show is that we take things that a friend uh, is super knowledgeable about, and we sort them into the various houses of Hogwarts. Today, we're joined by my longtime friend uh, and an actress and singer within the Los Angeles community, Mark and Greenwood. Hi there. Hi, Mark. So excited to be here. Oh, man, I'm so excited. We're, we're going to talk... Uh, acting theory today with you, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I pitched this to Reed like on a rooftop at a party, like, I don't know, like one six, of those, that six, six months ago. That makes my life sound a thousand percent more glamorous than one it actually those. is. I saw you and I was like, this is my moment because Michael's never going to put me on this podcast. But what? Reed, Reed doesn't know me, so he might. The, the history. Why would, wait, why would you not put her on the I podcast? I have absolutely no reason to um, not have her on the podcast. I've been pushing to be here for a while. Oh, oh my God. And then Michael be like, yeah. We, we, we were um, discussing theater, but drama is happening. I'm so excited. No. Work it out. We're like brother and sister. It, it is very much a sibling relationship. Oh, Mark, gotcha. Mark and I have known one another since middle school. Yeah. Uh, and and have done like we have so much all dirt my charm on one has since worn thin <laughs> uh also like we tra- we traveled europe together for 21 yeah, days and we are he still not- hasn't forgiven me. we are not compatible travel partners <laughs> yeah but it was actually quite fun but yeah. we can both agree fuck paris uh, right so that was the worst part of the trip but the french festival french festival was, was incredible amazing. yeah so wait speaking of french festival that's like the theater look at that incredible like, oh, yeah, right back around. Around. Back. As yeah. far as sorting biases are concerned, both Markin and I are Ravenclaws and Reed is a Hufflepuff. Yeah, so we'll be approaching that from that perspective. But uh, with that said, uh, let's just get a little bit of your background in theater, you know, and relationship to these approaches to some, mm-hmm. some yeah. varying degrees. Okay, well, um, I've been acting uh, since... I guess like officially middle school, um, you know, I did the like song and dance thing and then found my way into the warm embrace of theater mm-hmm. um, along with Michael mm-hmm. um, at that was time that in my life. Uh, is that where you like met? That's where we became good friends. Yeah. We had initially just met like during lunches. Yeah. And, like in circles school. overlapping. Yeah. Like where you just sit down next to somebody you're like, you're my friend now. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. We're going to be friends for years. awkward. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, we actually, we did some student original writing pieces in like oh my God, theater we, yeah, festivals we, we pretty, did uh, we did, amazing we did some musicals myself. together uh i really lived for that validation um <laughs> yeah we also did some like really mediocre um community theater together mm-hmm. um, really remedial <laughs> as it tends to be sometimes yeah, but very fun um and anyway so i uh i quickly kind of found my home and my identity in theater musical theater and then college came and i actually went the more musical theater route Mm -hmm. um broadway was calling um and i went to the university of michigan for musical theater but i always was you know acting first that was always what i loved with and what i was sort of like known for if you will um (laughs) she's the she's the musical theater girl who acts whoa (laughs) Like, it sounds funny, but it was like West Side Story at my uh, college program because the musical theater and the theater departments were completely separate um, when I got there. Um, And really, like, very little overlap. And I was one of the first people that was like, I'm going to go take some acting classes Mm -hmm. if if that's cool. And, like, maybe do some shows with y'all. Breaking down (laughs) some boundaries. Yeah, it was all because of me. Um, And then by the time we got to the end of college, the departments were best friends. Oh, that's Um, good. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Not really all because of me, but I was, like, one of the first people that was, like, doing that. Um, But anyway, so I got to know, honestly, in the theater program there, um, like, it was kind of a poo-poo platter of all of these different techniques. They were not like, we are the Meisner School. Yeah, because, like, you know? uh, yeah, especially if you're undergrad, like, like we got a lot to right. get through. And, and we got Reed, a couple you, centuries now. Yeah. You went to UCI and were I, yeah, I went to uh, Claire Trevor School of the Arts, which is also... Uh, tends to be focused on musical theater but mm-hmm. the but the divide actually here was between mostly the undergrad and the grad students because the grad students get like contracts guaranteeing them 
certain amount of things. Uh-huh. And then the undergrads like don't get you that. You just have to like fight for yourself. And they're like the undergrad department's like three times as big. So I mm. came in as a transfer student and they were like, you need to figure your shit out like in the next month or so. Like what no you want to do here. Mm-hmm. Hey, do you want to go to the BFA program? You got like a week to get start getting ready, honey. It was like very exciting. But uh, we also just like learned just a bunch of different techniques and uh, – even uh, uh, Robert Cohen is uh, is like uh, I think he was the head of the department there. He he even has his own theory that I can talk on a little bit because I usually use it when I have oh, to start nice. a, uh, developing a character. Yeah. So yeah, I'm excited. Um, but yeah. Uh, so yeah, I ended up studying abroad in London too. So I got like a taste of that world, like the classical acting there. Yeah. Is it um, is it, um, is it very different, like uh, culturally, the theater? I thought it was there? very different. Like, I I really felt like they're um, they are still kind of loving the outside in thing. Um, So the crafting of the body and the voice to, you know, achieve something and then trusting that the psychological stuff will just kind of be there Mm -hmm. um, because you you like built the field and they will come, you know, Um, whereas America, we've become so obsessed with the psychological, like the in to the out. Yeah, especially since like uh, uh, for for camera acting, it's so much more like just pulled in. Yeah. So like starting from the outs- outside can sometimes be like way too like much expression physically. Uh, I'm very, I'm right. very, I'm very uh, uh, curious to know what like what your preferences are too as we go through things mm-hmm. because I I think I might even be that way a little bit where I start a little bit on the outside. Yeah. And then because uh, I, I I'm always like well acting is a lot just doing actions is easier than conjuring feelings because mm-hmm. feelings are very unreliable right. <laughs> and i don't know what school of thought i'm really in because i just did theater up until high school and then when mark and, <laughs> and other friends were talking about what monologues they were going to pick and all of that for their auditions for colleges i was like wait a minute i don't care about this <laughs> it was at, like i can recount the exact space and time where I was when that thought hit me. And it was Markin was having a conversation with our friend Brendan. Uh, and we were in the back of the PAC, the Performing Arts Center in high school. Our home. Uh, like mm-hmm. right near the entrance in that like little upstep of seats right uh, right below where the light uh, or the spotlights are held. Mm-hmm. You know that specific little spot? Mm-hmm. Like right there along the hallway. I don't recall exactly what was being said Brendan was throwing out a handful of different uh, playwrights for you to potentially be picking monologues from. Mm -hmm. And I I just remember like my mind just kind of glazed over and was like, why am I here right now? What's going on? Oh, my God. I don't care about this. It it was like very. So was that when you decided to like go into film had you already been considering it or did you just have to reconsider everything i applied to both film and theater schools because i didn't know and actually i did that too that's so weird and i had gotten into uh, or not gotten into but had been like moving forward into the uh, the carnegie mellon like like do an audition monologue mm-hmm. phase and i was like no i'm not gonna do that and my mom was like what are you uh, his do- mom, yeah, his mom, mom, i don't know if we ever talked about it yeah michael's mom teaches <laughs> theater like uh like throws entire festivals for students she to could do probably theater. be doing this podcast better than me <laughs> oh well, I, I think you're great i would love to have your party. mother on as well no uh well, should we should we jump into so, yes. so some of yeah. these different uh, approaches? We, yeah. Uh, and uh, you said uh, maybe start with Stanislavski. I think that's a good place yeah. to start. Cool. I think so, too. Yeah. So tell us all about uh, Stanislavski. So, I mean, this is probably going to everything's probably going to be grossly under uh, simplified, oversimplified. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm just going to put that out there before we start and then I'm not going to apologize again. In true Ravenclaw um, fashion, really, <laughs> really hedging on yeah. here's right. a preamble. Right. Um, so, but before Stanislavski came along and kind of like made these observations and started like enacting them and maybe writing things down before that, it seemed like it was a lot of the like, we're just going to we're going to look and sound like someone and like, I'm going to imitate anger right now in a very theatrical way. Yeah. It was you know? also like melodrama, like before him was like the thing. And like, it was mm-hmm. just, just big, big, big. Cause you were usually also paying, playing for giant, giant houses. Right. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of that just comes from your Greco Roman roots of, 
a chorus playing playing to an amphitheater and mm-hmm. you need to be gotta hit the, the cheap seats honey you need and to people be were used to life. it P- mm-hmm. people expected that right. um and i can't really speak to what changed but oh well okay maybe 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 there's a little bit of the like as psychology bloomed and started to become a thing in the 1800s this was around the time of, of freud of right freud, yeah, yeah. He was sure like, he why was not like the like Early to mid 1800s, I believe, was when Freud was doing his thing. Yeah, and that was like the early teens was when Stanislavski was was developing his method, right? Um, or system. I would have to double check on that, but I'm fairly certain that it was like on or slightly after that time. Because I do know yeah. that Freud was getting heavily into uh, trying to shoehorn his psychology into as many dramatic works as possible the most popular example is hamlet where he he told everyone that hamlet suffered from an oedipus complex only because in one scene hamlet and his mother are in the same room and freud thought it was her bedroom it turns out they weren't in her bedroom uh in, in her room uh on stage, they almost never show like women's bed chambers unless there's like direct action that needs to happen. Yeah. So her room would have been like the off stage area, and then there they they were kind of just in the room that like she would hang out in as queen. Mm-hmm. Uh, and from that, he was like, "I can make this about me," and completely, I think, uh, distorted the way people uh, even see that character, and especially his relationship to his mother. Uh, yeah, very fascinating. Uh, and I and I think, I think. Uh, as we go along, it's only going to get even more like psychologically infused the action, right? Um, yeah. I mean, I feel like most of these methods uh, were born because we started seeing acting in a different way, which was that we have a responsibility to kind of get into our character's head um, and start really having their experiences and feeling their feelings so that it's more real for the audience. Um, so that ultimately I think ultimately they can be more sucked into what's happening and have like deeper catharsis with what's happening. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Especially for like characters who aren't the protagonist, it, it, you know, it helps, you know, to, to see like, like an antagonist as a, as a fully rise, uh, realized human being. Mm-hmm. If you can kind of see the, where they uh, came from. To, yeah. And to that was just like doing. not a thing. No, before. not before. <laughs> yeah. That was just, it was like, there was villain, no perspective. hero, like good, bad. Yeah. Very and, cut and dry. Yeah. And Stanislavski came in and was trying to make all characters in some way or another empathetic. Yeah. And, you know, especially at the just time. more human. Mm-hmm. And the you politics know? and the war at the time. And then, and then the war could be things. more of a commentary on humanity. I yeah. See. Um, okay. Wait, I just want to be a Ravenclaw for a second sure, and sure, say sure. that I was definitely wrong about when Freud was working. Oh. He was um, more working towards the end of the 1800s, turn of the century, which was when Stanislavski was working, too. So they were actually working around the same time. Okay, yeah. So uh, and I don't just, think that's an accident. He would have had time to like incorporate some of that meaning. It was yeah. sort of a tandem and, and, zeitgeisty. And the whole world, the whole yeah, the whole world was suddenly like, wait, but what's going on inside? You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> as we moved towards like machines taking over, we were like, wait. Okay. Anyway, um, okay. So Stanislavski, that technique is really just kind of the basis of, um, what we think of as acting now. Yeah. Um, like most actors are using some form of it, even if they don't know they are. It was just finally, um, you know, he still emphasized um, doing exercises for the body and the voice, you know, and to get that in good shape so that you can craft the character on the outside. But he also was asking about what's happening on the inside and what are the character's motivations and what are the memories that are fueling, you know, the emotions and the thoughts that are happening inside. Yeah. I think it's really fascinating because it's something we kind of like just take for granted as being common sense Yes, uh, we do. as an approach to acting. But I think that might be what his actual genius was. If you can develop something so complex, but so simplified to actually execute, mm-hmm. that is to the, to the point that you're like, Oh, of course I, why didn't I think of this? That is when you're an actual genius. Would he be mm-hmm. responsible for just like, the basic practice of scene study almost. Yeah. I would uh, say yeah, so. And thinking about like, where the fuck was my character? Like before they came in, like those Just sort of things, th- those, <laughs> the moments before the, that's yeah. for, for the person who does not act. That's something that I can even say going back to high school and middle school, we were always told like, 
think about where you came from right before this because yes. you need to carry that energy and you need to carry those emotions that's into your all scene. Stanislavski or yeah and going back like what was their childhood like these are things that we now were starting to think about when mm-hmm. we when we did that and, and, and then the body part was also very important because it was kind of a a continuum right I would say like where the, the mind and the body had to be working yes, together. together. Yeah. And he was always like uh, about both of them. Um, whereas we'll find uh, other branches that completely let go of the body aspect yeah. in mm-hmm. favor of the psychological aspect. Is there more to unpack here or do you feel safe in sorting? Well, I did want to ask who was the um, wizard who founded Hogwarts again? Was it? Dumbledore? No, no, no. No, what? No. no. <laughs> he just run this. Fun- Who founded it? I mean, it was it w- Gryffindor. It was Godric Gryffindor, right? I, wasn't it the four founders? And then there was. I feel like there was one that was more like. Look, this um, is a Harry Potter podcast that gives charge. very little credence to the actual the like movies. mythos of Harry wow, Potter. I, really, yeah. I thought you guys would like just be able to tell me this. Oh, but, oh, no, oh no, 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 no. I think that's okay. one of the weirdest things about our podcast. <laughs> and it makes it a very hard podcast to sell if you've not listened to it <laughs> before. Mostly people are just tuning in for us at this point. <laughs> and the, and the, I was the, here for the Harry, the Potter. Harry Potter stuff is a free. I feel cheated because <laughs> if I tried to actually impress people with my knowledge, I'd be getting letters Markin, constantly yelling what, at me. What is your Twitter? Uh, at Markinable, like marketable, but with an N. Gotcha. So if you are following uh, this podcast for the Harry Potter part of it, tweet at Markin and just say like, I'm here for that. Yeah, if, start a campaign against us to make us better what? at our jobs. You're, you're creating a schism already? If you're here for Reed or I, tweet at sorting hat underscore pod. Oh my God. Just here for the here for the Barity and Reed bits. I don't This is so meta because after Stanislavski, we're gonna see like his students like schism. split off into yeah, different like methods. Or maybe stuff, that was you know? all part of it. Mm. It wasn't. Um well, the reason I was asking him is because I felt like I, I kind of thought I remember Godric Griffin Bador being like the uh, the leader. I am pretty sure and it was four, but I, I'll. I thought that that could be a good way into talking about what house. Oh, see, you were trying to be very clever about it. And, yeah. Clever yeah. like a raven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we were like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> OK, but let's sort. Let's sort. Yeah, I I, I feel like. A lot of these, truth be told, but um, this one in particular is probably a Ravenclaw. Just oh, for sure. Based on, I mean, maybe there is a component that could be argued for Hufflepuff a little bit, but I think by and large, especially on the just deconstruction of a lot of it, feels more Ravenclaw, and it's like not exactly surgical, but Mm -hmm. more surgical. Yeah, I mean, the scene study aspect. Um, so much of it, is, it, it comes down to like analysis and being thoughtful about what you're doing, what you know, what you're thinking about when you do does. things. It yeah. does. Um, but I also would argue that um, in the context of it being sort of the first time that anybody really um, insisted upon people having a more realistic inner experience, um, there's a lot of bravery in that. Yeah, I would say that's true. You know, yeah, because they I were doing like highly political, like or like not even like necessarily like political political, but like you know, like he was doing stuff like with uh, Chekhov, right? Like they worked extensively mm-hmm. together, and that was very intense uh, for the time, sort of theater. Yeah, it wasn't as removed. It wasn't as like this isn't a fantasy world of like everything is big and yeah, you, know, you like you open it, on like a, a woman at the like window really saying, close. "I need to get the fuck out of this town, or I'm going to die here." You yeah. know, like that's that's the kind of stuff that they they were starting to like explore, and, like facing mm-hmm. the human. Condition condition yeah. and thinking about things that we don't really want to think about you know exactly and that's and just like venturing into the unknown that way um and like stating that you know the art form needed to expand um and people needed to be brave enough to like go to those psychological emotional places I well think is and also being so emotional is inherently gryffindor Right, because it isn't just, I mean, it wasn't just about the analysis. It was also about incorporating um, 
more real emotions. Yeah, and, and, and like, how can we get to more powerful memories. stories that way? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a great point. Let's sort for Gryffindor. Gryffindor, moving, <laughs> moving on. Aha. So now we reach the schism. This the schism. Um. So the next one in my list is the method. Great. Yeah, which a lot of people, uh, I think, like, conflate too much with Stanislavski. Yes, and it's do. kind of just oversimplifying his but work by is, cutting out the psychological that's stuff, That's Lee right? Strasberg. No, it's completely opposite. leaning into uh, no, no, the psychological. No, exactly. Yeah, yes. I, I just Cutting out the yeah, physical. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's Lee Strasberg. We're talking, like, Marlon Brando, mm-hmm, James mm-hmm. Dean, right, um, is in there. Uh, I mean, a lot of people were doing oh, method then. Yeah. The um, It was uh, the the group theater. Okay. Was the was the theater company in America in the 30s that was like that sort of pioneered the method gotcha. acting and took it because Stanislavski was in Russia. Right. Um, yeah. And so with Lee Strasberg uh, and the method mm-hmm. like that's where the whole bit of what's my motivation really stems from. Right. I feel more so than like Stanislavski specific. I think. <laughs> Well, I, what what I from what I understand about the method, I feel like the method is the one that if you talk to a random person on the street and you ask them if they knew any acting techniques, that's the one that they would say. Yeah, and like they would be like, you know, Daniel Day Lewis and everybody yeah, else, because like, it's so intense. Yes, mm-hmm. because these pe- because essentially Lee Strasberg was like, it's not enough to say um, to to kind of break down the scene and. Um, you know, say, well, this is what I want. And the fact that I don't have what I want makes me angry. Um, and just try to like summon that anger. Like if you are, you know, uh, an upper middle class, like actor who's never had to struggle very hard and you're playing a working class factory worker, mm-hmm. um, you know, who has never really been educated. Like he you're didn't believe, look stupid. Yeah. yeah. He didn't <laughs> believe you could do that unless you actually, intentionally put yourself in that person's shoes Mm -hmm. and that's where the intensity comes from the method where where like you hear these stories about these actors who like you know starve themselves oh like what's his name um vice Vice. christian bale christian Christian bale Bale. is like method for sure he Mm -hmm. is like he went from the machinist where he had lost all that weight to the point that he was skeletal he went directly to Batman after that, right. by the way. <laughs> like he, I, and he I bulks think, up and loses weight faster than anybody in And it's not just the Hollywood. physical stuff. It's yeah. that they'll like, you know, they'll move to a really poor neighborhood and live there for two months. Um, you know, and if you're playing a wrestler, you like train as a wrestler and you go on the diet of a wrestler. So is Morgan you, Spurlock actually also into yeah. the method? Cause he did that whole like <laughs> super size me and he had the whole show. He 90, was McDonald's 90 method days. acting. Well, like, except that that's reality. Well, yes, but he's trying to like. He may have been inspired by those people, yeah. though, because also a lot of these people like they'll take it even a step further and they will start playing the character in life. Mm-hmm. Um, like Jer- there are stories about Jared Leto um, on Ugh, the set the of um, Suicide Squad. Oh, that yeah. Gem. Yeah. yeah. Um, but essentially he like really disturbed his um, castmates because he was playing the Joker all the time. He sent one of his castmates a used condom. I heard that he sent a dead rat to someone. Ugh. <laughs> I've heard both of those things. So they have to be true. <laughs> and that's where and this is where it kind of like I'm like uh, people really misunderstand this this system of acting because it's not about like just literally going through the motions and doing insane stuff. Yeah. It's being able to truly sympathize with your character. Right. Like, like if you're going to play Hitler, you can't approach Hitler as I hate Hitler. Like you would naturally, you have to be like, how can I understand Hitler and be on his side? But, for the some, I think but at the I same think time, the you then actor would argue don't that have to they commit are doing genocide that. in yeah. order to like get that. <laughs> right. Right. You're like, yeah, I mean, but there are to, limits. You have to be able to uh, like, Figure out how he got there in his mind. Right. Yeah. But there there are so many instances of these like more outlandish stunts or like really yeah. leaning into it. Like the whole Jim and Andy thing where where Jim Carrey played um, uh, Andy Kaufman. And I think that was just an excuse for him to act out. Maybe. I, yeah. Like, after watching from like 
Mm, I don't. I don't think he necessarily but was as committed to that. I, that's yeah. Well, I, I didn't even. I, I do think that the method actors would argue that they are trying to understand the characters more fully than anybody else by trying to live as them. Yeah. But it does produce a lot of stories, like the ones we just <laughs> told, and it is really intense. Which is why I have an idea of where I would put it. <laughs> where do you think you would put it? I feel like I would put it in Slytherin. <laughs> really, I, I completely agree. Oh, see, I think this is the exact. Uh, I th- I think that this is still a Gryffindor in the fact that it's not couching at, like because a Slytherin would have the cognizance to like actually pull the brakes before it does something that's going to like mess things up. Whereas in the case of Gryffindor, you're like, I'm riding this character all the way to the bank. And then mm-hmm. you just are like, oh, I I did what now? I did this. I did that. Like, yeah. I think. I think from a notoriety standpoint, it is definitely the most well branded, which would make me lean Slytherin. But I think. Yeah. And and also like the schools are very difficult to get into to even train. Sure. But I think the 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 like over under makes it more Gryffindor. I hear you. But the destructive Gryffindor side. I like I definitely thought either Slytherin or Gryffindor for this one. But the reason that I would go to Slytherin is that like one. I feel like they're all about ambition Mm -hmm. and they're all about like perfection. Mm -hmm. Um, And they'll sort of go to any lengths. Um, We'll do what is necessary to achieve those things. Also like, uh, f- from an acting standpoint, like for, we're going like from systems that used to be very much as like, what's the whole piece and how does this one individual fit into the whole piece? And this one, you're very much going into yourself, into the, the single character. Mm-hmm. So I would say that that is you're more still feeling Slytherin. Oh, it is super, it yeah. is super self-involved too. Cause within the method, you lose all of the, um, outside in you, they, they stopped like, um, they stopped caring what the audience was experiencing Mm -hmm. in favor of complete realism, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And the other reason why I would say Slytherin is that it kind of brings out a darkness in actors. Sure. Like if you look at the people who are famous for the method, it's like, there's usually these like creepy stories (laughs) or, um, or they kind of spiral. Mm -hmm. Um, Like uh, I think that, um, uh, what's his name? He's so great. Um, who died a few years ago? Who played the Joker? Who also as well. played? Yeah, uh, um, Heath, oh, Ledger. Heath Ledger. Yeah, I think yeah. he was doing method with that and got so, he, into such a dark place mm-hmm. that, and that's the problem with the method that across the board is that, really and that, and Stanislavski was, was against it because it depresses people. Like it really fucks with them and they would not be able to um, get out of the character once they were done with the shoot or, or the curtain went down. So I feel like, cause a lot of times the difference between Gryffindors and like Slytherins is that like the Slytherins kind of won't stop. And then it goes, or like you, I mean, they skew into a dark place. Both of them have points of no return in their actions, but I, I, I see what you mean. I just yeah. like, I don't like the unreliability And I feel like Voldemort would be a method actor. Yeah, like I, <laughs> I feel like, yeah, I, I don't, I don't like that very much because it, it very much can lead you also for failure if you are relying too much on, on like, just like, how do I feel at the moment? And it does. It totally does. Cause at, like, that's why they call it acting because you're doing actions. You can, feelings. Yeah. You can't necessarily, you can't just be like. And I'm sad, you know, and it can I mean? be really boring for the audience <laughs> yeah, because, they're, that's another thing. because they're going completely inward and like, you know, th- there's just, um, I don't know. It can just become like, like if you looked at, um, Marlon Brando, he's like mumbling. Oh yeah. And, like, and I know he's really famous and we love some of the things he did, but some of them, <laughs> it's like, th- it just becomes all of that. Right. Well, you know? welcome to the dunking on the method podcast. No, uh, uh, yeah, it's uh. a Slytherin. What's the counter to the sk- on the schism yeah. scale? Wait, what do you mean? Oh, he, uh, he was saying like, what? What was the other school of thought that diverged from Stanislavski? Oh, right, right. Um, so, uh, a co- like Stella Adler, um, actually studied with Stanislavski. Um, and she was like the opposite of the method and that she was like, mm, no, this is kind of like, it's too self-indulgent. You're being too self-indulgent with this whole, like, I have to like 
experience all of this or I have to generate all of these feelings from my own experiences. Um, and she thought that actors could use their imagination yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> to um, craft characters mm-hmm. and have. Yeah. Or maybe experiences. like you need your imagination because no matter how much, like if you spend a week at, at a, in a hospital, you're still walking out there afterwards. You have like that privilege. So there's going to at some point be some sort of like disconnect and uh, uh, it can, you can be uh, tone deaf emotionally very quickly. <laughs> but with this one, it kind of just takes some of that out and it's like, okay, well, what if I actually was somebody who was in the hospital and uh, like, how would that feel? And like, mm-hmm. what would, like, how would my body be like in? And I, I, I really like that. I think that's approaches closer to. Where so I we're go. definitely like, yeah, I, there's I, some humility there. Yeah. So, so this is a Hufflepuff, right? For this one. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I think, I think a Hufflepuff, um, like, uh, she definitely, just the I just as soon as you said imagination, I was like, oh, so this this one's the like like not not to yeah because in- it's also fair. It's like it's like anybody, right. regardless of the experiences you've had in your life, anybody is capable of using this amazing tool, the imagination, to um put themselves in somebody else's shoes. Right. It's, you know? it's anybody can paint a painting. Anybody can play a character sort of concept. Yeah. Yeah. Like if if they throw enough at it, they can come up with however they want to present this thing. Um, I didn't mean to like she said, like, you have to get beyond your own precious inner experience. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's in but, very ways like stark contrast to the self. It's leave yourself at the door. Yeah. yeah. And just this isn't like about you. But there is still like a little bit of a link psychologically. I think especially when you're trying to uh, evoke like maybe a uh, sense sort of uh Things like uh, I remember, I think it was um, who's the dude from The Graduate again? Uh, uh, Dustin Hoffman. Dustin mm-hmm. Hoffman. Yeah. He was talking. I think it was. I think it was, this was Adler stuff that he was talking about. He was doing a play where he had to get shot. Mm-hmm. He was like, obviously, I don't know what the fuck it's like to get sh- actually shot. Mm-hmm. How can I on? Um, how can I like actually make it like in my body? Make make you buy it? And he just couldn't figure it out. And then one day he went to go step into the shower and went, oh, went, oh, my God. Oh, and went, I and don't. So I don't have that. I don't have that exact thing. Yeah. I have something that will make your whole body react uh, as far as like the nervous yeah. system going and uh, fight or flight activating. And he used that. And then they were like, that's perfect. You're giving us exactly what we want. Mm-hmm. So and I he didn't that- have to go to some dark psychological place <laughs> or put himself in mortal danger. Although I do to find believe that. Dustin Hoffman does lean towards method, but maybe I'm wrong about that. I just remember they're also reading in the many stories of Hollywood of he and Laurence Olivier were in something together and like he like ran three miles or whatever. And yeah, Lawrence he's Olivier like, I want to like, be physically exhausted. And Laurence Olivier is like, what the fuck are you doing, man? Like, <laughs> but yeah. Neither yeah, he was here like, or there. Oh yeah, Olivia was like, oh yeah, because Hoffman was like, I did all this stuff in order to act, and and then Olivia was like, ah, when I want to act, I start acting. <laughs> oh yeah, I love him. There's a story about him too, where he would go to a rehearsal, and all he would have was a pencil and an apple for like a full day rehearsal. The rules. He just sounds like such a badass. <laughs> um, um, what's next in, yeah. on our acting train? Okay. It's the Meisner technique. Which yep. I think is another one that some people might know. The yeah, Meisner technique. Might be able to At least the name has like some recognizability. Yeah. It's like a household sort of name. Yeah. So tell about tell us about Meisner. Um. So he's like also kind of an offshoot. Um. But in a different area. But I don't think he studied directly with Stanislavski. Um. But so what I know about I haven't done a whole lot of Meisner technique. But what I know about the Meisner technique is that um repetition is a huge thing. Repetition like, is a huge thing. Yeah, re- repetition is a huge thing. 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 Repetition so this is, is a what huge uh, <laughs> an acting one one class is like. If you go to college, you'll get a script where you literally just have the same lines over and over again, and it's it's because it's supposed to help you stop overthinking the words, mm-hmm. stop doing line readings, mm-hmm. have um honest impulses in the moment that you follow get out of your fucking head yeah I, yeah like this was one of the forefathers for improv theory which right. we'll, we'll cover mm-hmm. a little bit more yeah uh what is there anything else and it really is different it? than any of the ones we've talked about because it's less about like crafting a character 
and more about um, just living in the moment. Right. Yeah, which is very important. This is the one that, I mean, would probably make, uh, if if we're shifting to film, this would make a editor go fucking crazy (laughs) with any Meisner trained actor on set. it would never be the same. The continuity would be all off. Think of, uh, like, Robin Williams is, like, the ultimate, like, on acid Meisner person. Yeah. That's why they... Oftentimes, just so spontaneous. Most of the genie lines uh, in, in Aladdin, yeah. he wasn't even like acting for anybody uh, in front of him. Most of them were improvised. Yeah. Just based off of like how he felt reacting to the, the, the work. Right, right, right. Yeah. And uh, I think they're always going for that spontaneity mm-hmm. um, in Meisner. Maybe not quite at the Robin Williams level, but. I think uh, because from there, it's very more developed in, in improv theory. It's like definitely part of like the fundamentals of it. But even like some film directors like David Lynch, they love like w- uh, what he calls like happy accidents or something like that, mm-hmm. which can only happen if you're not necessarily in your head about like getting it right. Mm-hmm. Uh, when they were shooting the pilot for Twin Peaks, uh, the dude who would eventually become Bob was just their, uh, I think, set designer or or something like that. He wasn't an actor. But Lynch caught him in the reflection of a mirror in one take, and he looks so frightening. Lynch went, oh, my God, you're the monster for this show. While they yeah, were shooting I the pilot. That. And so yeah. I think that I... I, I yeah, it was just like a well, great. We, we just you were looking to wrap some some Twin Peaks in there, weren't you? Reed? I love David Lynch so much. He's such a freaking weirdo. <laughs> I have an idea of what I think this is. I do as well. Do you read? What, what do you all think? Okay, well, I feel like I didn't come in with this, but I'm kind of feeling Gryffindor. I am too. Because oh, yeah. like, I think Dumbledore would do this technique. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like he'd be like, no, 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 stop, stop, stop. What do you feel right now? Like, what, what's your impulse at this moment? Because that's going to be what opens that mirror for you. Well, I think it, it's, the whole, it's the whole concept of like throwing everything out. Yes. And just all the being, rules, throwing all the rules out. The, the spontaneity of it feels very yeah. Gryffindor. Well, yeah, Whatever but Gryffindor you do is, in the moment is the right thing. Like yeah. Gryffindor is which are, I feel like a Gryffindor would Gryffindor say. Gryffindor is like, get themselves prepared. They're very capable, but then they're just ready to go. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Shifting. Oh, okay. So this is the one that I wanted to talk about that um, Reed said he might not know so much about. But, no, not at all. Yeah. But then you have ones that you want to talk about that I don't know bit, so much yeah. about. Um, this is Michael Chekhov, um, like his technique. Um, and <laughs> really, this is just an excuse that I I just wanted to talk about when I worked at the Michael Chekhov Theater in New York. <laughs> no, please do. <laughs> totally fair. I like I'm I'm living for this. Uh, Show me everything. Well, okay. So what it says about the Michael Chekhov technique is he created a famous psychophysical technique, which draws on physical actions and mind body connection to create a sensual approach to the character. Sensual. Yes. Um, In the sense of like of the senses, not necessarily always sexy. Sexy. Yeah. I um, need you to never use that voice again. I okay. my boner my boner's gone forever. So very sorry. <laughs> so um I mean So sorry, back that up. What does that mean? Right. I'm kind of trying to um find like a better uh a better description of that. Um, he was he was very tied to. I'm just looking at a little bit. Yeah, he's very tied to Stanislavski. Also, uh, apparently, uh, Stanislavski referred to him like as like a really, really, really uh, like great actor. Like he was like that's but not the nece- shit that I want. To but not necessarily a acting. protege. I don't know. Gotcha. Because okay. like I said, I don't know this as much. I'm just like looking uh, like a little tidbits as we go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well. The reason that I was just it it just brought up this memory that I had um, of uh, this like it was like I was a baby actor in New York. I knew nothing. And I got kind of pulled into this scheme um, at this theater company. Schemes a tricky word. Good scheme. Not good scheme. Yeah, that's Um, how schemes usually go. Bad scheme. Okay. Um, and uh, like it was at this, it was a theater that was in Midtown, which seemed really cool to me, who was brand new to the city. Um, but essentially it was like you paid a 
um, you pay dues, monthly mm-hmm. dues, to be a member of their company. Not necessarily unheard of in the theater circuit. Yeah. No, not. And and I guess, like, yeah, I mean, certainly I'm not saying that it's always bad, but there was this guy that ran it, and, like, he was so intense. And it sort of reminds me of, like, Norman Bates with his mother. Oh, like Because apparently his mother was this amazing actress. Um, and, mm. I mean, you know, at that point, was probably in her late 70s, 80s. Um, and, like, he just kind of, I don't know, was the keeper of this school that she'd started. I can see how this suddenly gains an increasingly negative connotation. Yeah. <laughs> and he just was, like, Obviously living off of like our like meager dues, you know, running this thing and like giving us like quote unquote classes every week. Um, And at one point and I actually did a show there and uh, at one point it was like um, I had actually paid my dues, but he thought I hadn't. And he took me out of rehearsal and scream like sat me down and screamed at me in my face oh my um, about the fact that I hadn't paid these dues, which I had paid. Um, and like, I'll just never forget this, like, I don't know, 50 something year old man, purple in the face, screaming at me. I'm just weeping. Like, I've never had anything like this happen to me. I'm so sorry that happened to you. And I told you it was just an excuse to tell that story. I I get so mad. I feel like the working class uh, of the theater community gets taken advantage of so badly in terms of like, just being nickeled and dimed for everything. Actors are expected to invest hundreds of dollars, thousands mm. of dollars in their training and then upkeep and they have to look good. And it's just it's just impo- almost impossible yeah, to, I'm to sure, also live on. I'm sure if we were to get a uh, other friend of the pod, Abby Wild, back in here because she was telling me because she's currently in town uh, for the Cripple of Inishman. That's the name of the play. Absolutely. Uh, and. If you're listening, Abby, and I misremembered it, you will more than likely tweet or text me that I got it wrong. But please go go see it. It's still running uh, yeah, by the time that this but, airs. But um, she was telling me all about like how, yeah, there, there are just like theater circuits that like, yeah, some of it's paid and you're, you can't participate unless you're a member and that's the way that you get around like – some stipendy system or something. And that doesn't even get into like the unions and stuff. Yeah, like, man, there, it's wild. It's nutty. It is. And then in the improv schools, are it's, we, it's a cult and you just yeah. pay thousands of dollars. Are we sorting this paid. one or are we just well, like. I guess I, I did. I did find a little bit more great. about it, which is like that. Um, from what I can understand, Michael Chekhov, um, unlike the method, like was thought that it wasn't just our job to. um like imitate life. Mm -hmm. He wanted us to um, kind of educate people about it um, and like, yeah, use it as a means to like educate people. He's looking to raise the veil off of our eyes, basically. Yeah. And he would uh, use these gestures where um, you try to figure out like what a, a character's kind of like overarching psychological need was and then you would um, tie it to a physical action, um, like maybe hugging yourself around the middle. Um, and then you'd sort of have there be that like outward physical manifestation of that. And then you'd have like an inward physical manifestation of that. And then you would weave it through your work. So <laughs> that feels heady as all hell. It and, does, doesn't it? Yeah. And- Kind of Ravenclaw and kind of like talking yeah. down to people because it's like, yeah, that's we need to like, Ugh. it's not enough for you to just have it's a the worst parts of Ravenclaw. Yeah, but it's a Ravenclaw. I agree. I'm, the- I'm saying Ravenclaw. So maybe from there we'll go to me, yeah. maybe like the diametric opposite of that yeah. with Viola Spolin. Okay. Which I can, uh, which I know nothing about. I can speak <laughs> on a little bit. She tell us, read. She believed everybody could be an actor. Mm-hmm. And the way that she, you could unlock this was through the sense of play. Mm-hmm. Um, Back, uh, back in like the the I want to say forties, fifties, because uh, uh, she would become the inspiration. She would develop what improv theory is, and uh, her theory, uh, along with her son Paul Sills, would uh, 
they would create the second city together and second city was really the launching point of improvisation Impro- gotcha yeah and then uh del close studied with them and then he developed his own I stuff, mean, which we, I won't even get into. We should set aside a whole thing for no, improv. Just, but just yeah. so people have some context, it, it kind of went Spolin, Del Close, and then the UCB4 is kind of like where theory has been pushed mm-hmm. in, the, in, in the improv world. Mm-hmm. But going back to Spolin, she developed a lot of her stuff while teaching um, at the, the Hull House in Chicago. Uh, that's where the Second City got started, right. most of comedy in America. Uh, uh, and she had all these kids or and or students who didn't necessarily all speak the same language and so she would create like li- she just called them games and she would say that the technique is play you're 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 locking you're you're untapping your ability just to like respect yourself and make big choices and have fun Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the idea of fun being injected into acting theory is unheard of. Usually, like you're <laughs> like acting teachers want you to slit your wrists on uh, right. on stage. She was like, no, maybe we all just get in a circle. Somebody starts singing a song. We all start singing the song together because that way, if one person, because really what it comes down to is actors freeze up when they feel like they're going to look dumb. Mm-hmm. When they're like, I forgot my lines. I went mm-hmm. up, or I don't know what to do in the moment because somebody fucked up, and she went. What if you just don't worry about it? Trust yourself that you know what to do. Do it, but make sure that you are also uh, on the same page as your partner. This feels, I mean, it, it's very ensemble buildy. It's sort all of. ensemble. Yeah, also, it seems like it has an element of uh, clowning. It, yeah, like if you're trying mm. to think of it, like what it would be in the in the acting class thing. Like, you know that thing where you have to do the mirror exercise yeah. where it, it, you're like moving your hands? Okay, partner all up that. and then... Two people who's leading who at this point. And that's why improv is very heavily suggested to actors, uh, especially now, uh, because they need to learn how to actively listen uh, Mm -hmm. while they're acting, because it's not enough just to have the lines in your head and to have your own preparation. It's still like, especially in live theater, like anything can happen. Yeah. And so it's very good to be like, I can look my partner in the eye and we will know exactly where to go. Improv theory kind of just like, is like a, a laser focus of that idea. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. this is a Hufflepuff. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> how, how, how excited I was. It's to called get theater here. games. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm actually, uh, I will let people know I'm actually starting to develop my own acting theory and it's going to be going back to Viola Spolin's uh, idea of play. Oh, snap. And maybe even going further into the idea of what, what how children play uh, because I feel like children are the most entertaining creatures on, on the earth. Uh, so hmm. that's that's my theory. It's going to be based in Spolin, uh, and I and I'm I'm going to be also actively trying to teach comedians who don't take acting classes, but maybe go to these classes. Uh, I want to teach acting for uh, improvisers and comedians theory. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's stuff that I will be maybe rolling out in the next couple of years. <laughs> we'll see. If you really nice. want to double dip into a business opportunity, oh boy, I love a what's the grift? Uh, the grift is you double up as a daycare center and then you tell actors to come and play with children and so Honestly? and you don't pay them for their services because they're paying you to interact with the children and it all you think comes that that's out funny? clean i have literally babysat like i love children so much that like there there are a few people at the pack theater which is my main hub who have children mm-hmm. and babies and stuff sometimes you just are like my babysitter didn't show up, but I have to do the sketch show. I've just sat and watched people's children. I would absolutely Aww. be a nanny acting teacher. Honestly, though, children are the most honest actors. <laughs> oh, for sure. Like, they're so spontaneous and they yeah. aren't self-conscious and they just go with whatever they're doing. You can feeling. take the most capable and entertaining actor in the world, yeah. put them on the stage with a three-year-old. Everybody Who is everybody watch, watch a three-year-old? Yeah. yeah. Children and animals. Exactly. Um, <laughs> yeah. I all mean, right. New pitch. All you go to a zoo, you get actors and you throw them in cages. See how well they fare. You can give them spears oh if you want. Uh, call uh, it a like gladiatorial. Oh my lord. Yeah, so that's gonna be happening at the pack theater. Uh, yeah, I, I, so yeah, I, I think that's great. You said that there was one more uh, that you wanted to talk a little bit more. Uh, so it had practical um, I meant, in the yeah, first word? I mean. I mentioned practical aesthetics. Um, yeah, but what is that? Like, I don't know a whole lot about practical aesthetics. It was just kind of as I was like brushing up on everything again um, for the podcast, it, it kept coming up. And um, it's 
William H. Macy, the actor and the playwright David Mamet, um, do it at Playwrights Horizons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's like super based in text analysis. Um, and, uh, seems really heady. And I, I, isn't Mamet really precious with his writing? So that would make sense. (laughs) Mamet writes out stutters. Like that's the level of, He's not an asshole, but he's an asshole. asshole yeah, like <laughs> he's an it, asshole. It, he's he's one of the writers who like puts the text above all else. You need to follow mm-hmm. it to the mm-hmm. letter. Didn't he write that, and they that one play? Ha- a, a linea was that a mammoth play? The, the teacher and the student. Yes, yes. And that like that very much. Oleana. That o- Oleana, Oleana. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. It opened my eyes and to he, like the kind of person that he was. Well, and he's also got. Glengarry Glenn Ross and um, I mean so many of those texts and I'm of course immediately blanking on everything else that he's written but uh, a lot of that has those stutters those pauses all written in the text and also has a lot of like overlapping Mm -hmm. or, or intentional overlapping dialogue where it's it needs to run at a rapid fire pace that is likened akin to Sorkin maybe a bit mm-hmm. I can definitely see like if Sorkin what like maybe Sorkin being influenced by I that, did I did have him. the good fortune of seeing Glenn Gary Glenn Ross on Broadway with um uh Alan Alda as uh, uh uh who's the main character in Glenn Gary Glenn Ross I'm blanking but uh it was it, like I'd never seen Mamet performed like exactly as like Mamet is supposed to be performed but it's definitely, um, like, I would say pretty heady stuff. Yeah. Like, so I would go with Ravenclaw for that yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the minute I read about it, and just the name, I was like, this well, is, that, yeah, this is very, <laughs> like, like, I, you know, me, I, 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 as you're explaining, I was like, this sounds pretentious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so those are our, our, the, the primary main schools of, of theater. Yeah. Uh, acting. Thank you so much for coming yeah. to talk about this. Like I, I never like I've been out of college for like over five years now, and now it's like I'm I'm like oh yeah this is all stuff I need to start incorporating into my research as I as I go along. So thank you mm-hmm. from like thank a you. selfish standpoint. Thank you, Markin. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's fun to nerd out about this if, stuff. If we want to find more of you, we can. Uh, be, people can be following you at Markenable. Uh, mm-hmm. Markenable. Yeah, Markenable. like marketable, but with an N. N yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I just need to change it to at Mark and Greenwood, but I haven't. Uh, that's on Twitter. Do you have you have an that's Instagram? On, no, too? sorry, that's on um, Instagram. Instagram. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if there's anything you uh, you want to plug, go right ahead. Yeah. Otherwise, um, plug. Yeah. Well, uh probably gonna have a short film out in festival soon um otherwise i'm just out there living the life yeah <laughs> i wasn't You're, prepared yeah, to so plug anything. Her, so like, i don't have a new acting technique that i'm coming up with <laughs> honestly and i could like it, it, it could end up being bullshit who knows <laughs> but that's yeah. part of the fun that's, but that's part of like the f- why we're here also so that we could get to the point where we'd plug that right, right, right sure that right picture, yeah. <laughs> uh, no i want to do a follow-up podcast where we go through like the different um acting schools in LA and and sort those because I know the, the one that I go to I know what it is and <laughs> and Michael pointed out there's a reason you go there yeah so yeah um. <laughs> <laughs> we can just say it because like because you're, you're talking about Leslie Kahn right? yeah I go to Leslie Kahn and like that is to me 100% Ravenclaw yeah, yeah. and like and it's so funny because she's always like why are you being a Hufflepuff <laughs> like why why are you not being spontaneous and right brained because we literally spent like all of our time pulling apart everything and like deconstructing it and analyzing it and i say that with all the love in my heart like it's such a great um it's such a great technique and she's so smart um okay well, i'm yeah. sold we're having mark and back to do <laughs> la specific acting techniques I'll, sure. have to, I'll have to do my research I mean, on that one can, i'll have to talk to my friends we can also happily yeah. have you back for any other subject even if you wanted to be like <laughs> let's do our trip to Europe like we <gasps> oh, oh my God. goodness we have we, to yes we could so do that All right, I, it's on the books until yeah, then okay. you can follow us at sorting uh 
hat uh, underscore pod. pod. <laughs> I just opened Pandora's box. Um, Jesus Christ. Uh, at, uh, that dang dingus is my at on all of the things. <laughs> <laughs> You're falling apart. You can follow me at Belated Media. Please like us and, you know, give us positive reviews on wherever you're listening to us and share us with your friends because that's a thing you can do. All right. Bye, all. Bye. (laughs) Exit pursued by a bear.